<laughs> it seems to be constant that seminar rooms are always cold yeah. everywhere. <laughs> so, but we don't want to issue a cold, but a warm welcome to Matthias Berry, <laughs> who will tell us today about how to do fully formally verified satsoving, I believe. So, without further ado, Matthias, please, it's a pleasure to have you here. So, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for those who came here after you know, watching some lectures from people on my own. <laughs> so the story actually started with the beginning of my PhD. So it started in a slightly different context. And at that point, it was not foreseeable that I would do very, where I would go as far into software verification as I did. So what happens is where well, you start a proof, basically usually on a whiteboard, then you start writing things on the whiteboard. Okay, great. Except that you discover that one of the things on the whiteboard was wrong. Okay, great. You fix it, hopefully. Then you write a paper. Yes, your proof is correct. I have written some Latin. <laughs> well, hopefully, right? <laughs> uh, then you extend your paper and like, yeah. And like, let's make a journal version. So you change some definitions, some explanations, some proposition. Then you have to extend some proof. Okay, switch to the screen. Okay. And then you want okay, you want to change this, but actually, what do you have to update? Right? So you have some. And this is annoying. Then you have to read your entire paper again. And you, so you read your paper and then you say, oh, I have to change this and hopefully you have found all the mistakes. But sometimes you do not. I know people who submitted papers with the definition 1.1 one, definition 1 .1 being wrong, which didn't impact the rest of the paper, but it happened. So this is annoying. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative would be to use a proof assistant. The problem is usually you start young and motivated. And yeah, <laughs> I'm not completely in that state yet, but I'm much older than when I started. So, so yeah, kind of it's it becomes a problem. But when you have a proof assistant, you know exactly what has to be updated when you change the proof. But sometimes you're not so sure about this. Um. Yeah, so one other example I can give is that, so for the for site community, because the series is reasonably easy, actually, the case is it's usually well understood and people understand it well. In the community, in another community I know, was, uh, which is automated, called automated reasoning for the people who are doing position, the theory is a lot more complicated. And here there are stories about some people asking one of the experts, Uwe Waldmann, saying, oh, in this definition here, there is this extension, but do I need this case, actually? And Uwe spent two days on looking at proofs and said, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> That's the good thing about Isabel, right? Isabel will tell you, yes, no. It doesn't tell you, I think so. It tells you, yes, it works. So this is how the Isafor project actually started. The idea was, okay, let's build a library of formalization of logic so that you can use So it's Isafor standing for Isabel formalization of logic. Um, so motivation, so behind this, so we work on proof assistance and automatic provers. So it's kind of nice to use them together. The idea was to, especially, what I was supposed to do, or what I started. Uh, yeah, so it, the idea is to build a state-of-the-art library, and there is an ongoing textbook project by Christoph Weidenbach, which I do not know what the current state is. You can come, I think it's been 10 years that it should be released next year, every year. So maybe at some point it will. The state is dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> I. I don't know. I'm not sure. I think at some point he mostly gave up on giving up, or the editor gave up on asking for updates at least. But it's so it's dynamic, dynamic. It's, it's a good way of expressing. And the motivation is to focus on for the EFOL project is to focus on meta theorem, try to reuse proofs and try to be as general as possible. So 
things which are in the ESA fold project or slightly half moved to the AFP now. So there is some resolution, ordered resolution and approval by Anders Stichtrul, who is now in, he's in Denmark and I don't, they moved from, finished his PhD in Copenhagen. And then he's somewhere, I don't remember. There is also an older civil position entry. There is an unsub checker. Um, he updated it for this year's Ichka. And there is a CDC at NSAT solver, which I will talk for a long time now. So, why do we, I mean, yeah, you are all convinced that we need to make our SAT solvers correct. I've been told that you hate fuzzing now, or some, <laughs> or at least in the MaxSAT context. So for those of you who don't know fuzzing, which probably is other few people, the idea of fuzzing is that you generate random problems, then you solve them, and you check what the solver did in the way you can do it. So if you are lucky, you can check models, you can check proofs, and you can check, so you can check models, check proofs, and check assertions. If you're unlucky, you don't, you cannot check models, and not because they're not finitely representable. You cannot check proofs because there's no proof checker. Well, then you can only check assertions. It's better than nothing. It actually finds uh, many problems. And the rule of thumb is non fast code is always wrong, even if it's a bit depressing to see. Um, one exception my verified SAT solver survived fuzzing. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it and verification pays off. I don't need to pass my code. That being said, we will talk about it a bit later. The part which you don't verify can be wrong, but that's proof for later. Something which you are specialist here is proof certificates. The problem of proof certificates is that you're required to check the proof on each file. So you run the solver on one file and then you check the proof. Um, this is less important nowadays because we have the RPB. So the question is, do all techniques that can that you can use be represented by proof format? For DRAT, the answer is no. For very PB, I'm not sure if very PB is the most general you can get. I let I leave this question for theorists here. My impression so far is everything that can be represented that you might want to represent is representable, but I leave the question to. <laughs> okay, I see Jakob not being too happy. So, so far, so good. So, so good. So, right? Well, that's basically solved by VerPP. And in this talk, we'll talk about program verification. So, the idea is that it works for every input. So, you have the overhead of the execution, and it does not crash even if you run the program for a year. Um, and running the program for a year is something that you generally don't find as fuzzy because fuzzy usually don't let your fuzzer run for a full year, or at least not on one instance. So there are stories about people letting their program run for a very long time and then having some, because the number of today's some overflow in a certain number of bits, and then you'll observe be a weird behavior. So the question here becomes, okay, could you use proof certificates? Um, that's not clear. After one year, you have a very, very large proof and it probably cannot check it anymore at that point, even if it answers the proof. The other question whether you actually want to run your solver for so long, but that's a different question. But none of this matters if your base calculus is wrong, right? If you have a wrong CDCL, then it will be wrong and you will find it, but, or actually you might not find it because you might get lucky by fuzzing. Um, there are some restrictions on what we verify. So basically, in what I do, parsing is always trusted. Um, if you know Cake ML, so from Gothenburg, they have some modelization of a file system is. Um, they have some assumption of what files are and what you do. So I don't know if you have ever tried to grab AA from a file which actually contains AA in appendix. <laughs> Let's see if I, I 
can try it. This to on screen. And we do want to minimize this uh, control thing. Yes, no, yeah, you just uh, far right. I think on more you can minimize probably no. Wait, hide video panel yeah. halfway down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Whatever. Okay. okay, so let's just do some echo to a file. Okay, let me reset this. Grab a a, a. grab them. Yes. A from file. So this is what you expect. Let me redirect it to a file. Yes. And cut. let's see what's in this file. Why? Uh, uh, because of, okay. Let me just add some more. Like to be more. Uh, Wait, why is it not the... There's a temp for the second file. Ah, uh, there is a temp. temp. Right, if I don't change the file, it will not have the effect I want. Ah, you, you start complaining. Ah, actually, there is no security to complain. Okay, sorry, then I cannot show this. I would just tell you what happened before. So what happened before is that temp would read a certain size of the file, search for it and print the output, and then it would read the next file. So actually this grep could lead to an infinite loop because you have a side effect. So you are reading a file and changing it at the same time with this type. Uh, so the problem is that a file is an inherent is inherently a side effect problem. And what you do is that you are in a modelization, you say, oh, yeah, it's a side effect, but it's a side effect. I kind of assume that it's not an issue. <laughs> but yeah. It's it can be. <laughs> yes. Uh, technically, printing the answer is trusted too. So I ha don't have a modelization of printing. I can tell you a story. At some point, I was always printing unsat instead of printing sat because I got the condition, the if condition wrong for printing, which I realized at some point when I saw. Too many discre when I saw discrepancies, and I was like, What the hell is happening? Oh, I just printed unsat each time. Oops. The other problem is that the SAT solver, which is produced or which I produce, live actually outside of the of Isabel. So there is no way to say in Isabel, oh, I run the SAT solver, it's correct, because technically Isabel loses a link between the SAT solver it generated and what it's doing. So this is a similar problem to where PB, as far as I know. So basically, there is some loss of, there is a loss of connection here, which is kind of, which is sad, but it's not clear how you can keep the connection. So, um, verification. So I'm not the first one, and I'm probably also not the last one who tried to do some verification of that solving. Um, so here you can see several attempts. I have attempted to sort them. And okay. So in blue, you can see people who are mostly interested in the theories so of getting their CDCL right. Uh, uh, it was the one. Okay. So it was done in Cog, the two version. There is an earlier version of Isabel. In Isabel, there is a, so this both were CDCL. Then we have some DPLL version in Minlog, which I've never heard about. Then we have my own work here. So, and so basically, there are the people which were most in blue interested in the theory. In red, what you can see is the demonstration for the tool. So, usually, what they do is that they are either working on some tool for verifying programs. 
and then basically they show it on the example or some approach that they want to show. So there is a word in PBS, there is a word in Guru, or the sets of the verset. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting because the solver is from 2012 and Guru is al already lost from history. So it was based on GCC Java, which you probably haven't even heard about, but doesn't exist anymore. So the set solver still exists, but the, so the checker doesn't exist anymore. So there is a uh, here. Here, up here, some people who worked in F sharp, and the most advanced work on the, this side here is closed uh, in Rust, which we'll talk a little bit more. Um, as far as I know, this one is started as a tool demonstration to show that the approach worked, but that's the point. I also switched to let's try to get it fast because it's fun. Um, just to, so they followed this approach here, followed a different approach. So what I did, right, is I started with CDCN and I tried to get code out of it and some other people just did write code and let's try to get a proof out of this, a different approach. So basically in the master thesis, I managed my master thesis and I should go functional code for DPL. I had no restarts, I had stupid propagation so basically, I just iterated over all clauses, and my decision was just going over all clauses and picking the first non set literal. Very far from what you want to do in a modern set solver. I benchmarked it once, it solved no problem from set competition, which I was not surprised because propagation is not right. But I mean, it terminates and it's complete, but it doesn't solve any problems, so not the most useful one. And this here from Kaka, who is in Austro, if I'm not mistaken. Well, basically, in a, he did imperative codes, he had CDCL, restart, watch digital, and a proper decision. And he solved 150 problems. That's the set one. So clearly, there must be a difference in the approaches here, right? And the approach is where do you start from and what you want to learn? So my approach was, okay, let's start with the top. I have some theory, which is expressed in my tool. So this is always a deep embedding of the logic. So for example, you define, okay, my clause is a multiset, my model is an assignment of literals, and then you define what assign, uh, to be a model is, what the semantic, how the semantic extend from one clause to clauses in the usual way you can see in textbooks. So then I refine it which is uh, putting a lot of work. And then at the bottom, you get some code out of it. Um, as far as I know, all full verifications go top down. So you start with the theory and then you go down to code. Um, the SEL4 kernel is kind of mixed. There is some specification, then they go down to Haskell and then they connect C to Haskell. And the partial verification, like the one I just mentioned, which in the master thesis went much further than I did, they go bottom up. So what they do is they start with code, then they add annotations, and then they call a tool, which is supposedly, and they have some theory, and then it proves it. Um, yes. So here is a, data, which I will find out. Yeah. Um, there is only one bottom-up work which proves completeness and termination, which is a DPLL approach, which is the last one here in true set. Uh, and by my definition, this is cheating because they have a DPLL without stateful heuristic. So the heuristics are MOMS-based for those who remember from the 1990s. If you were not doing such solving <laughs> in the 1990s, it's a decision heuristic which basically try, which is counting the number of occurrences in the non satisfied clauses. So, this is a non stateful heuristic because usually things start to break when you want your heuristic to depend on the state and on what happened before. If you have some history, then things become immediately more complicated. 
let's talk a little bit about the theory because I mentioned that we have some theories, so let's mention what it what it is. So it's a shallow, um, yeah, it's a, well, it can be a shallow embedding, but usually, uh, all examples I know, it's a deep embedding. Usually shallow, shallow embeddings don't work. So we have a deep embedding, so you, as I mentioned, right, you redefine what the clause is, you redefine what an assignment is, and then you work. So instead of using the booleans provided in the theorem proof already. Sorry again, could you elaborate for us non-experts? What, what's the difference between a deep embedding and a shallow embedding? So in your proof assistance, you have some you have already um, you have booleans, right? Already you have booleans, you have true, you have false, you have the a disjunction and a conjunction. And the question is, do you use this in the proof? When you work on the theory, do you use this? Or do you define it again? So basically, uh, let's call it my true, with my false. And you say, OK, so E is a model of so an assignment is a model of the clause C, and you define this, but you introduce it as a definition to mean, oh, there exists a literal in the clause such that L is in the assignment. So this is a deep embedding because you basically introduce a new definition, a new series of symbols, and it's not completely obvious that this matches the true and the false you have in the proof of system, which are already existing. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened typically in most proof assistants is that there is no way in the proof assistant to reason about the terms themselves. So there is no way to reason about the terms directly. You can reason in terms, but you cannot reason on terms. Oh, you're saying like the proof assistant can use disjunctions and it knows what they mean, but now you want to go at the meta level and yes, say like this is yes. a conjunction of yes. some disjunctions and then you're sort of, that's where you want the deep embedding to be able to yes. somehow view this as, well, quote unquote, syntactic objects, yes. kind of. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so, yeah, exactly. So then you work within your proof, uh, theorem prover where each transformation you do on in the theorem prover must fit in the, in the logic. And the theory is what you make out of it. So you should try to make your theory as easy as possible. So for example, I verified a fact checker which was talking about polynomials and the application of it was multipliers but we only verified uh, the checker was only talking about polynomials, so the verification was also only talking about polynomials. So um, in the context of stat solving, what's the theory? So for bottom up approach, so the, the theory is basically resolution. So what they actually do is to verify that each transformation they are doing is an example of resolution. So in a certain sense, what they're doing is um, kind of inlining the checker in a code. So the code is the proof. The proof they're using is just showing, oh, the checker would be able to find the proof. In the top-down approach, you start with models. And then you say, oh, CDCL is actually always finding the model and it's terminating. In that way, your theory is a little bit different, right? So it's much more abstract. So. Once you, in the top-down approach, you start with a model, so you can start to reason about semantic, about what it means. Now, CDC, uh, yeah, so for SAT, SAT is reasonably simple. So I think you agree on this. There are a lot of much more complicated things around. And, uh, uh, so there are a few other things which have been verified. 
So there are some flood checkers, which you know, you know that much more than I do, but where PD has a verified core. So, and there is an ordered resolution solver, which is, yeah, which was, mm, and there is an ordered prover, and I think I forgot here to update this slide. There is now also a QPF solver, which is really which is one of Tian Weber's PhD, uh, master's students, where I did to get so in Isabel. Um, there are all the things which have been tried. So cylindrical algebraic decomposition. So this is a very advanced and clever way to solve very complicated arithmetic. Um, they tried to define things and they already had problems with just writing out the definitions properly. Problem being that it was very mathematically advanced. So already at that, they think they wanted to, their ultimate aim was to actually write a certificate format, but they just failed at writing down what the meaning of the object they were manipulating are. So let me talk a little bit about the bottom up approach. So in the bottom up approach, you start with some executable source code. And then you do two things. On the one hand, you use a compiler, or if you are lucky, you use a verified compiler to produce a binary. And this gives you code you can execute. And on the other hand, what you do, <clears throat> so usually you start with the middle one and then you abstract it, and then you verify the abstract code for verification. Um, there are also some cases where you start with the abstracted version, which is exported, and then you get source code, but usually you start with some executable code where you can think of it. Most advanced, this is all about this uh, Skutum I mentioned, he has some translation from Rust to tool code Y3. So basically, he brought in Rust the code, and then it's abstracted to Y3, and then the verification happened there. Um, yes, one thing to mention is that usually the abstraction process is not verified and they also sometimes can take some um, liberties in the modernization. For example, in this tool here, there is an option to just assume that there is no overflow interface anymore, which is reasonable to do, but it's kind of not might not be what you want to do actually. So the key idea of the bottom up approach is that basically the checker is a very so the checker is exactly the verification process. So in that case is actually the checker is exactly the you're just checking for resolutions and in practice you might try want to check some more complicated things. And so the, the correctness they have is that if you manage to derive false, then the problem was not satisfied. Because if you just resolve clauses and you try to derive false, then the problem was not satisfied in the first place. This does not say anything about correctness or anything about any about satisfiable also. So what they usually do is that if they answer satisfiable, they have to go over all clauses and check this actually has, yeah, um, some invariants which are which they have. So if they derive the empty clause, well, the problem must be answered. If there is a conflict on the current level, this is a runtime assertion. So either this is a runtime assertion, or you just trigger restart and hope that you will not run into the same problem again. Um, Yeah, so basically it's you hope it, but it's usually uh, termination is unknown, right? And if you have no conflict and all variable is fine, you just check for module. This actually requires to keep all clauses all, all along. So you cannot just delete clauses in the middle. And the question and whether you can prove that there are no crash that depends on the approach. So if you have runtime assertions, they are here to fail. You just assume that they are true. And you hope that they're also not too expensive to check. 
because you can make very complicated station shapes. Um, so what do you actually have to prove? Well, you have to prove that it's going to behave in the sense that you don't read past the length of an array and that you close and not modify it by resolution, except by resolving your clothes together, right? So that you don't remove literals like, to make your problem simple. Um, this is non-trivial for minimization, where the resolution you actually do is implicit. So we know it's possible to do it. I mean, there are LRAP proof for minimization, so we know that it's possible to find the resolution, but it's complicated. Um, I just short small uh, short, short story here when I proved verified minimization. I also thought I could do could go with the resolution, but I gave I gave up on this. I found the resolution too complicated, and I went for semantic argument with uh, with Intel. I found this much easier to handle. So so far, no the no bottom up approach has ever verified minimization. Also, we actually know that would be useful. Now let's take one step back. Just imagine you have your CDCL solver and then you decide to add restart. What do you have to change? Okay, so a restart means you could backtrack to level zero. Cool, you have to have successfully added restarts now. I mean, you have to do heuristics, performance, debugging, the usual things, but basically from a theoretical point of view, there is absolutely no difference anymore. Um, what is hard in this approach where well, you usually re or always rely on automated provers, which must be able to handle the specification, so it can be complicated. So you have to swap literals, so there might be some complexity here. Uh, if your pro automatic provers, usually SMT solvers, are not able to handle a problem, then you don't get feedback also. They might just run forever. And something which runs forever doesn't give you any information. There is no termination, which is, yeah, I, I usually or always interactive theory improvements don't like non-termination because it's very easy to derive inconsistencies if you are not careful. But the main advantage it has is that it's very close to a program by hand because actually at the core, it is the program by hand with annotations. So it makes it much easier to try different strategies. Um, in my approach, when I try a new strategy, I have to change a few thousand lines of code, and sometimes I just revert it at the end of the day. This is not so cool. So let's now talk about the top-down approach, which I would describe as the art of proving way too much. So my journey into this started with an abstract CDC. So I don't need to show you how CDC works. At least if you, for those who came to the lecture, they have an idea and we don't need more than that anyway. So um, when I started to formalize it, actually I started with a DPLL with back jumping, right? So the, and yeah, and basically, well, CDCL is DPLL with back jumping. And actually I had formalized this very abstract thing. And then I had DPLL as a special case where the backdrop rule is instantiated with the red clause. And I started this with the calculus of Neil and Weiss and the others. So this uh, standard paper from DPLL to DPLT. So to maximize reuse, basically, in the group assistant because I want to be general. So backtrack is basically a parameterized back jump with some condition and basically I just restrict it to have DPL. So how does this look like on paper? On paper, I'm like, okay, if there is a clause, which is uh, if there is a conflict and there is a, conf a clause C prime, then you know, search out certain condition holes. And actually what I do is I don't can backtrack. And in either way, it's sort of actually very similar, except that I add some additional condition here on C prime, such as this works. Now, obviously, you should not at all, uh, you, you should make your condition such as produce something useful, so you should not at all. So I kind of ended with a zoo of calculi, 
for PDCN. So I started with a steep PLL with spike jumping, which I specialized to PLL. So in technical terms, this is a locale where I added some conditions to it. Then I have um, CDCL, which is an extension of DPL with back jumping, which contains learn and forget. And because you have learn and forget, you actually get non-termination. Because if I learn a clause and forget a clause, I'm in the loop. Uh, then I can restrict it with a strategy used in most implementations, the only back jump clause. So you back jump, you learn a clause, basically, then it's terminating again. If you restrict forget, and then you can add restarts. So adding restarts makes it non terminating again. So you can combine it, and you can actually restrict restarts, but it terminates. Um, there are actually two ways of restricting restarts to make it terminate. The one is that you restart less and less over time. So you increase the distance between two restart. This is what this is the approach to use in the paper, in the original paper. The other approach is to keep more and more clauses. The point being that you will never learn a different clause, uh, the same clause twice, which means that eventually you will have learned all clauses. This is the approach used in most set solvers for competes, actually. So keeping more and more clauses on it. Um, minor detail here in PSAT. The, the, um, the distance between two restarts is slowly increasing. I think it's something like two close logarithm of logarithm of the number of conflicts or something. So it very slowly increases. It's completely still mostly come from keeping my process. Okay, so now we have this abstract CDCL, which says, oh, there is a clause which has some properties. So how do we get a suitable one? And then I started to verify um, based on a paper by Christoph Weidenbach, which is why they put W. So basically he decomposed the spectrum learn into three different rules. So conflict, skip and resolve, and jump and learn. And so he has some concrete way of doing it, which is not important for the slides. Um, because the calculus was a little bit more complicated, I had to do some, or to prove that this was a special case. Basically, here you have a tuple with the traits so of the assignment you are considering, the initial set of clauses, the learned set of clauses. So these are the clauses you can forget, and just remove. And here the conflict. And so to prove it in Isabel, we have this conversion of this state is converted to this state by this formula here. And because the one at the bottom is a special case, if the one with the version before is terminating, then the version with this is also terminating. Okay, so this is great. Now we have the CDCL, but is it actually what we want? And then I went, I continued, and actually I wanted to have watch literals because I wanted to see if my CDS, CDCL was really useful. So if you have never seen watch literals, so it's a very sophisticated data structures to identify propagation and conflict, and very short what you do, and that every clause that is long enough, you will distinguish two literals, which are called watched. And when you propagate the value, you only are interested in the clauses where this literal is watched, which are way fewer clauses than the full number of it. Right? So I am. So in all other literals, you can actually ignore. So sometimes, actually, you have to swap literals with condition I will not explain here. So there are some restrictions on what you have to do. Uh, one thing to remark here, you can see that this literal here is not watched. So this clause here with a single literal is not watched. That's because things get complicated with it. So if you have one literal, then it doesn't fit into the watch literal scheme. So actually you have to make your 
calculus more complicated to support this. Okay. So let's go a step back now. What do we have here? So I started with the CDCL. I refined it for some abstract code for verification. So I went further down than just the word literals. Basically, I added heuristics for decisions. And I refined further. And then you can export this to have executable code. And then you can compile it. If you are lucky, you can use KKML. If you are not lucky, you can use just the standard compiler. Um, some points to see here. Um, so there is this combination here. So there is an Isabella tool to actually generate code in the same semantic used by KKML. Two minor problems. It doesn't support imperative code. So we don't really want to use a SAT solver for it. And second point, it's slow. I've heard about some nights it would take for a longer piece of code. And longer pieces of code was much smaller than my SAT solver. So I've never tried it out. And so the point is that the idea is that the translation from here to here is so easy that it's trivial and you can trust it. Now, actually, there is now from Peter Lamich, you can generate LLVM code. So LLVM is a, comp if you use a Mac computer, you are using Clang, and Clang is LLVM. So it's Apple, with, uh, it's an official LLVM version with some patches. So it's a professional compiler developed by many people, and it's a pretty cool compiler. Um, KKML versus compiler, because here there is a trade-off, right? We have an untrusted compiler and a trust and a compiler which we know to be correct. There are two things to know. Um, KKML has a higher level of trust. This is assuming that you have the same semantics. If you have a tool that does a translation, but it does a translation with a different semantics, then it doesn't help you. It is not standard ML compatible, which is the pain. Or, yeah, it has their, they have their own language, basically, so it's not super useful. Uh, there is no support for monomorphic areas without indirection, as far as I know, if someone is in the chat and saying that maybe they have added it. So basically, when you have an array of words, actually, you don't have an array of words. You have an array of pointers to words. You don't want your clauses to have a pointer exit each time. And as far as I know, at least KKML targets more functional code than low-level imperative code in the way I write it, because my code is basically C code written in KKML, so uh, written in standard ML. Um, this is already an issue when I tried a long time ago. I took two, comp two standard ML compilers and I looked at my code, and basically, once one code was already finished when the other had, I think, not even finished part of it. So polyML is also not optimized for low-level code, and it's already so much slower that I never used it if, besides trying it on a very simple example. So what the main idea? So we have a, something which I call pragmatic CDCL, which is fully correct. So there is some more, there's one more level of refinement between CDCL, which I showed before. But I actually verified in the end. And the correct, the to, we have total correctness, which says that deriving button if and only if the problem is not satisfiable. So if we have no conflict and a total assignment, then our problem is satisfiable. And we have termination, which is guaranteed. Um, in the LLVM version, the correctness is slightly different. So here, if the answer is not unknown, then it's either SAT with a proper model or unsat. And basically, either SAT in the standard ML had full correction, which I cannot get with the LLVM version because the model of the semantics um, does allow arrays larger 
Yeah, it does not, it allows areas larger than two to the power 64, which I need for completeness. Um, I don't know any compiler who supports it. And I have to admit, I never, I've never seen a case of unknown so far also, because it takes a lot of time actually to write so, so much memory. And you probably would have, you need the machine which is large enough to support that much memory. So. So um, let me show you how the code synthesis work in a nutshell. So basically we have some codes here. So for example, we access um, some element at position I in the list. And this is on the Isabel side really written for the list. And I use a tool called Sepref, which generates imperative form, which is a modelization of the heap, so what is imperative code. So this code would look like array for access the nth element x of i. And then this is translated to a standard ML via something called code equation, which basically say, oh, how do you have to do the translation? So for example, the nth operator is not called nth operator standard ML, but standard. And yes, now XS is a native array. Sounds great. Except that this is not what's happening. What's actually happening is that the code generates the flags. If E fits in the array, it generates the element or it raises out of the box. And that's because the standard ML semantics tells you that the errors must be checked. The accesses must be checked. And the reason for it is that the information is lost. So assertions just disappear. Um, in either set, at the point of standard ML, I just removed this test. There was a flag, I just used it because I knew that it can happen. And um, the other thing is that in the nice Isabel world, you want to use a TNP integer, which can become as long as possible. Then you don't have overflow problems. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> For performance reasons, just that. So what I did in LLVM is to use the machine word of size 64 until it did not fit. And if we really needed it, which never happened, because again, 64 bits, actually then I would, I would switch. And you might say that it's stupid, but actually it improves performance. Um, the alternative, which I use now, which doesn't have that problem, this is Isabel LLVM, so it's the same workflow as before. So, oops, sorry. So basically, I use Sepref, which is this time not an imperative whole, but in some semantics of LLVM. The advantage being that the printing printing is trivial. Um, the inconvenient is that I cannot use TMP, so I'm limited to the size of the integer I can have but it's like much, much faster. And much much faster means I got a factor two out of it. And a factor two by doing nothing is always a good game. So, I think I have uh, something like five more slides before the break. So, um, what does it mean to have a, Right, so now I have all this code, right? So I started with CDCL, we refined it, we have some working code. Let's think about it. What it, does it mean to add restarts? Well, adding restarts mean that, well, you have to change your CDCL because now you need a, you need a counter either to increase the in, interval of restarts or to create more and more clauses. You need to change the refinement because now you need this extended CDCL with restarts. You need to add restarts with counters. You need to make sure that they don't overflow. And then you have it working. So then with restarts. So this is a lot more work. And you actually don't, you would still have to look for heuristics of performance debugging. But the ESA, uh, the SAT solver will not help you. The verification does not help you with avoiding performance steps. So let, um, here is a performance of three verified SAT solvers. 
can see here either that version, you can see cross that version for the other, which I mentioned to be verified by master thesis, and versa, which is older on the SAT competition 2022. So this is a CDF. So the amount of time here, and here the number of problems. So optimally, you would want your SAT solver to be just a line here. It should solve all problems in zero seconds. If you manage to do that, this is great, but you probably have a bug there. Just want to mention. So you can see that my solver performs just much better than all the others. Uh, there is a catch, which is that PSAT solves much more problems than this. But in the competition of solving in the uh, for the verified solvers, I'm I'm winning. So, as a last slide before the breaks, before the break, uh, before question and break, um, one thing which is kind of sad is that there are very few applications of verified SAT solvers except finishing last as a SAT competition, or yeah, or second to last, depends, getting masters or PhDs. Um, one sad fact of life, which was noticed, or kind of sad, depending how you see it, is that uh, Max observed that in 2022, either SAT was a solver correlating, correlating the least with TSAT which is both an indication that there were many TSAT facts in the SAT competition this year and indicating that there was a bug. I did find one bug there. Um, I can, was it? Yeah, I think it was there. Um, but it was a bug because I had some code which was mixing a reduction and garbage collection at some point. I was actually running, I was garbage collecting every time instead of just the marking flows that's deleted. And I never realized because I had this I had the same swap in printing the statistics. So the sad uh, verifying code doesn't as long as the code is complete, the proof assistant will be happy. And if the code is not complete, then it will not be happy, but that doesn't mean that you don't have bad facts. Um yeah, basically, I'm not aware of application where proof checking would not be possible. So in practice, this would nowadays mean a very small machine with not enough memory or very long runtime, which, as far as I know, doesn't exist. Or maybe that you have some proof checking where you have some steps where you don't want to add the And some interesting question is what is the right timer for the SAT competition. So I'm currently I'm taking part in the SAT competition with all the other SAT solvers. So I'm also expected to produce proofs. I do produce proof, but it would kind of be funny if I would get also the checking time once increased time out. Uh, I did run it once, I do not win the competition. So even with the extra time out, my solver just, it, I mean, you have, the curve is always flattening so well, basically it just gets flat and so it don't solve more problems. Okay. So um, this was the end of the first part. In the second part, we will go deeper into this where I talk more about the refinement. Are there questions so far? What would you say is the most uh, important feature that you don't have? Like if you, what would be or your, you know, your top three wish list? Where would you take us? Um, viable elimination, implementation wise. So this is according to benchmarks extremely mm -hmm. important. My the second thing on my wish list would be. It would be a good way to know to know where I'm losing performance. Um, so I have a theory, right, let me, let me show this slide already. I managed to find it. Yes, so here you can see the comparison between ESAT in black and ESAT in red. And there is a big gap. 
Uh, here you can see in blue, this is catechol, and in this color here, it's either side. And in theory, they should perform, I mean, it's with the same features activated, basically. And there is still this gap here. And I would really like to know to know where I'm losing performance there. So I know also to some extent that my memory representation is less efficient. I have some ideas how to fix it, but I just but I don't believe the gap is only this memory representation. So just some way to tell me what's happening would be, would be the second thing on my wish list. And I think the third thing on my wish list would be a very a nice refactoring tool in this event. <laughs> would not be SAT solving related, it would be just a nice refactoring tool. Because then I could experiment easier and do changes, which would be easier. I mean, obviously, so the, the fourth on the list would be a, a list with what are the in-processing techniques which are useful in when. <laughs> <laughs> but that's on the wish list of every person who is doing SAT solving. And the answer is not clear. So so suppose you know let's look a decade ahead okay so a lot of research has happened and a lot of people have had lots of smart ideas we have some super safety critical application of Maybe SAT or maybe Max SAT or you know something in that general neighborhood. Do you think like if I want really really efficient code, but I also want to be absolutely sure that my results are correct? Do you think that we should you know what should we do? Should we convince the funding agencies to put much much more money into? formal verification methods and get better at writing formally verified code is that where you would place your main bet or you know or is it like you know we should really do more fuzzing or is it like you should you move over to the proof logging camp or like what's your um thought? this is um okay i think the Three level, I think that it's the first, it depends a lot on the application. So, I think for there is there is already this tendency for crypto protocols now to do some verification on them. So Amazon has been funding this because they're a huge vector of attack. So, you really want to avoid overflows or some accidental things. I think for this very critical things at the core, there is an interest there to have full verification. Mostly for the small bits. Now that doesn't mean that you won't do them wrong because you have an API and it's working with non-verified code, but it's actually the first place to start. Um, on the Verification. So if you really want to have some verified code, I think your best bet is proof logging. In the end, it's the proof logging. Eh? Because I mean, in the worst, so no, to say it differently, I think it depends on what the penalty is if you have a bug, basically. If the penalty is, okay, you have to wait five more minutes or something, let's say, it, you are waiting at the airport and then you have to wait five more minutes at the gate or something, just take another max SAT solver and hope that it doesn't run into the same bug, basically. Um, if you have the NASA and sending something a probe to space and this will decide whether the probes crash or not, this is a very different question because then you probably won't have the luxury to restart it, to restart the process of solving. 
and then I think you should you should invest into verifying this bug solver if you're really new. Point being that you it probably in 10 years will afford to run a second call with a checker, but if this checker says it's wrong, then the question is what is the penalty? And if the penalty is just your satellite or your system crashed, then it's a problem. And I think if you're not in that case, you should use both. So for most or nearly all applications I can think of logging, I think there's a way to go. Unless, so this is assuming that in 10 years we have fast maxup checkers, which you are working on and I haven't seen the uh, upcoming your CP, so, uh, yeah, you work on things. I haven't seen it, so I don't know how fast the verification is. So maybe in 10 years or something, we'll be at the point where like that solving you would be in a factor of, in a factor of five or something, or if you generate error proofs, you are in what 10% or something. So then that's just I would go for I would I would go for proof in the meantime. So there's a question from the virtual audience from Kieran. So related to this, what would you use if you wanted to convince the general public that the algorithm can be trusted for making decisions that affect their lives? Do you think they would believe that formal verification means that there are no buffs? Yeah, I think that's a I mean, in practice, or we do right? in the sense that in so in France, for example, uh, the, the train railway is basically using tools which are producing proofs, and if the proofs pass through, and basically it's accepted as the highest level of verification. So the law says it's fine. Now this might not convince the general public because it's the law or something, but it's already a good start, right? To so have some lawmakers agreeing on. That you should verify, or that it's verified. Um, the yeah, the example of this is um, this the case in the UK, right, with the post, the people working for the post, and then the software saying that they stole money, which led many people to be fired, go to prison, and some committed suicide. This is the most extreme, and it took 10 years. It was a known bug, which was never fixed. And it took 10 years before they rec the company recognized that it did something wrong. Um, so I think that more convincing actually than verifying the software would be to produce a proof, a certificate that the person cheated. Because then a human could check that, could check that. Uh, so you have a log saying the user cheated because, and then have a list. It might be a very long list. It might be very boring to read, but it's something that a human can check. Actually. I think this would be more convincing because you have a proof which you can understand as a human. Actually, it's probably an argument for proof checkers, for, for checkers and for proof logging. Or at least if you can reconstruct it in in retrospect, right? Mm -hmm. If you before you before you say that you fire someone, maybe you should check should check the evidence before, right? So, but this is it's an issue of society. I don't I don't pretend to have a good solution to this. The question itself is maybe beyond the reach of mathematical <laughs> <laughs> Any any other questions before we take a break? So otherwise, let's let's uh, thank Matthias and uh, uh, let us take a uh, ten minute break, and then we'll be back for a continued second half. Okay, so we're back for the second half. 
with uh, Matthias. Uh, please, without further ado. Okay, so let's continue and do a little bit of more details. Um, so this was the first change to the calculus I made when I finished my PhD, or after the PhD. The problem was that I wanted to implement some in-processing and I had problems, so I decided to change the base calculus. So what I did is that actually I split the clause into several things. So the clause I want to propagate on, the tautologies, because tautologies never propagate, so you actually never need to keep them. The subsumed clauses, because if they're subsumed, well, and the clause of links one. So basically, I put a lot of things in my state, which were, which were not there before. And the only thing I want to keep in memory are these clauses here, and the rest I actually don't need to keep. So from a proof theoretical point of view, they are there. They are actually important to, so my solver is basically parameterized over a set of all variables that can appear in the problem. This is why you want to keep this because there might be some literals that appears just there, but it's only a technical argument for the proof. What I did is, I, I, so I split my clauses and all the things here are just not represented in the final refinement. And yes, yeah, so altogether, the, the, the idea is that the set of all variables you can ever use in the problem doesn't change. And the argument for tautologies, it has another side effect that it makes the size of clauses smaller. Um, yes, one nice of, yeah, this is a master thesis by Katharina, who left her, yeah. Um, Basically, she was tasked with uh, formalizing the model reconstruction, which, yeah, I have a type of size. Anyway, from the first one. So, so she worked on model reconstruction and its formalization in Isabel. So model reconstruction is the idea that you can, during the run, you can throw away some clauses. So for example, viable elimination, you just store the clauses and then it's a way to fix your model on. So you eliminate one variable, you get the model after elimination, and then you have to fix this model to find the model before elimination. Um, I started to refine my flat solver in it, but it did not work out. Or it did not, it had some trouble with uh, the environments I have. And we, there were two surprising things. The first one is that in the paper, so this is, uh, there was a definition of most general redundancy, which turned out to not be the most general one. And actually was, yeah. So basically you could not remove tautologies, which is a bit annoying, right? You actually want to remove tautologies. And the fix to this, so the proof in the paper were correct, but this is, basically mean that we don't want to have this version. And the fix was actually requiring total models in instead of partial models. And the interesting bit in this is that the code in Cadical was correct, but because it did not implement what the paper was doing. And actually by talking with Armin, Armin has had mentioned in the past that he had seen this box before, but he never realized that there was a mismatch in the theory, so he just implemented the version of total and so and was happy. But he did not realize that there was some problem here. And the problem was that the definition was not what he wanted to. So the paper was correct, but it was not. So there was a mismatch between the first part, which is the theory, and the implementation. Um, So in for my calculus, there are many things that I would like to implement. Or yeah, this goes in the direction that you have. So things which you could implement, so chronological backtracking, which yeah, is practically mostly a sign that the decision heuristic is bad. And the other problem is it's helpful for some problems, but it doesn't help according to benchmarks. So if you're in that competition, it doesn't help. And there is on the fly self subsumption, which is noise, it's sometimes useful. 
it's again, right? There are problems where this is useful, but on average, it's not. So variable elimination. Um, so if you go back to this here, could you actually quantify that that you said the chronological backtracking is good when the decision heuristic is bad? I mean, that would be it should be a testable proposition somehow in the sense that you could try to for the um, instances where chronological backtracking is good, you could try to whenever you learn a deep clause that somehow causes a huge back jump that you should you could somehow bump the relevant variables to actually force a reordering of the decision heuristic? And see if this um, actually improves it. Am, am I making any sense? Okay, so first for, yeah, I'm trying to think because this is not how I would have tested it. So wait, you want to bump the heuristic the variables? I mean, this is, so in the move, to, so if your decision heuristic is moved. Oh, but wait, why? Actually, yeah, I don't know. Why would this be true? I mean, the, the fact that you learn something deep and then you force a massive back jump. It's not so obvious, right? Yeah. It's. No, but, but you, 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 but you you're could saying that you would like to skip you, all the decisions in between somehow. Yes. What you could do is to calculate the recursive LBD. And so the LBD from all levels which are involved, and that you could check actually. Right, so you go recursively over the all clauses you needed to propagate, and you look at which level you actually needed. Yeah. This would be a testable way to do it. Yeah, this would be worth trying out this, just to quantify this. Yeah, I mean, firstly, it would be a way to actually test because what you, I mean, it's sort of a nice yeah, the observation slash claim. I haven't thought about it this way before, but like it should be quantifiable and that should potentially yeah, give yeah. a heuristic. Like the, whenever you see this massive back jumps, you could say, oh, I need to like, uh, I need to rescale my VC things. I, I want to put extra emphasis on, on all the variables in these particular levels. And now let's see what happens. Yeah, the thing is that the move to front heuristic is basically doing this already. Because you, I mean, yeah, not completely. Yeah. It's. And yeah. And yeah, so the second question is when you do chronological backtracking, then you lose some precision, right? Because the variables may not be propagated on the level they should be propagated. This chronological backtracking, because you don't fix the standards. Which means that your this might be different, so you might get a different value than the level you would get otherwise. Yeah, yeah, no, but in the in the testing case, you would stick to non chronological. Ah, you would stick to non chronological. And whenever you see this phenomena with with the massive oh. back jumps, you would you would use this as an argument to rescale. Yeah. Or you could, I mean, you could collect data on on, and you could try to run it on benchmarks for which you know chronological yeah, back tracking pays off, and then just have a special heuristic to see can we replicate this in the standard setting. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Uh, sorry for some <laughs> No, no, it's, it's fine. It's interesting thinking. So, um, so back to model reconstruction. I wanted to just mention why this was incompatible with my splitting. So basically, I have a, an invariant which says that my subsumed clause clauses are subsumed, right? So if I have a clause which is so this is a consumed. Basically, I have a subsumed clause, which I, does it work? Somewhat. 
somewhat. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, so basically I have a subsume clause and then I have a subsuming clause and basically the argument here is that whenever I have a subsume clause where well, there is a clause which is subsuming. And the point being that uh, whatever transformation I do, so if I shorten this one again, then actually there is just, there will be another E0, which will be shorter. So over time, I will only, there will always be a subsuming clause. The problem is when you start to eliminate clauses, because like you would do in model reconstruction, and this invariance just breaks, right? Because you might say, oh, this clause actually I don't need anymore, I want to delete. Right, so in a in a certain sense, what you are saying is that actually this one you also want to see. So this model reconstruction thing is providing you a better argument. It's just not compatible with the way I was doing it before. It's nicer, but it's not compatible with it, which is why it turned out to be much more complicated than I had, I had expected initially. My first thought was, oh, this will just all work out and be fine. And this invariant I don't need. I can start proving. Put it sorry in Isabel, I can do the rest, and then I realize, oh, actually, it is a big problem. So I have to change my rules. That okay, so um, this is on the level of theory. So now let's talk a little bit more about the refinement. So the watch literals I've actually defined as a television system. So it's not yet in this in this monad where you have some assertions. This comes afterwards. The proofs for it were rather long. So I checked them. It's, non, it's a rather long proof. It took me a while to do. But one thing which I realized is that this proof were actually very stable and changed very little over time. Because basically the watch literal scheme is pretty much fixed in stone in all solvers. It's there are some minor differences, but they all fit in the same calculus, so I never had to change the proofs. The only time I had to change the proofs was when I introduced um, blocking literals. And that's because it works differently. Um, yeah, one technical point, which is a little bit annoying in the refinement, is that if you look at how my state looked like in Isabel, actually, if it looks like this. So basically, I have a state S. And when I want to extract the train, I call a function which is replacing the train by a dummy variable. So I extract the train. Okay. Oh. So I extract the train. And then I can do some operation on the train. And then I add back the train to this. Um, this sounds very stupid, and but that's the only way to make it compatible with the refinement base. So the refinement approach, and yeah, it's a constraint. Um, yeah, at some point I was using tuples for the state, and then at some point there was an update in the library I was using, and an update meant that every function I was doing would take 20 minutes to refine. So well, this would take 20 minutes. And then when you have a longer proof, it would take several days, probably. I never waited that long. So basically, I needed to this operation of removing things from the state and adding it to the state. It's kind of technical. It's kind of annoying also. But it works out at some point to get used to. It just took me one week or something to implement. So. Let's talk a little bit about some related topic, which is code generation. So the structure I'm using looks like basically this. So you have a struct and then you have elements of so the train and clauses. And basically what the code you would like to write basically is, oh, it takes a trail and I do some transformation. And here I'm going to put it in. Yeah. And here it should be also solver. But Kisa does something a little bit differently. So Kisa typically does here, for example, an assign function. It takes a solver and it takes actually elements of the state as parameter. And this is something you cannot even represent in 
the formalization I'm using because you have some aliasing because value is included in the solver. And so there is no, I cannot represent it. Armin claims that it's important for performance. So maybe this is one of the reasons there is this gap in the CDF I showed earlier. But it's probably not the only reason. Um, I tried pointers. So instead of having a state, I tried pointers. I actually tried very long pointers. It took me a very long time, and I never managed to make it less than 10 times slower. And I'm not kidding. I added pointers, and it was 10 times slower. I tried to optimize the code by hand. I managed to get it two times slower. And afterwards, I realized that the first thing the compiler, so LLVM, was doing was to remove all these pointers anyway. <laughs> so then I decided that, OK, I don't like pointers anymore, and I stopped. Um, yeah, this is one of the things which you have to realize when you go into program verification is that at some point, all this code you are doing, all the things, you will look at what the compiler is doing in the end. And if the compiler does something you don't like, then you have to change what you're doing. And you have very little control over it. Uh, one thing to mention is that all this work needs, so the entire formalization needs actually a much uh, higher level of inlining than standard code. And the point being that for verification purpose, you want to write small functions, which are doing only one thing at a time. Except that in real code, you really want this code to be in line, even if it's across several codes. So whenever you verify a program or synthesize the program, you should increase your level of inlining to by a factor 20, and the first thing you should try. It destroys profiling, but it will fix it. Um, yes, so these are the current levels of a refinement I have. Yes, the current level of refinement with a number of lines of code, which I did not update, so it probably changed a little bit. So yes, I started with CBCL and restarts and some rules for end processing, so this is pragmatic CBCL, which is 4,000 lines of code. Then I add watch literals about it. So this idea of you have only two uh, literals per clause to watch. This is 8,000 lines of code. Then this is actually two levels. So I replace my clauses by lists and I add watch lists over it. So this is 12,000 and 10,000 lines of code. Then I add heuristics. So you can see here this gets very long. So what in each of this refinement, Something happens or some transformation happens, but I still keep termination and correctness from the bottom. When I have this code here at the very bottom, I can do synthesis using the separate tool I showed, which does it automatically, and it transforms it to something like 16,000 lines of code. And then I can do some pretty printing, which, and then I get LVM automatic representation, which is 25,000 lines of code. And there are some 800 code, uh, lines of code of C because of, I need a parser, for example, to pass a problem. And I also want to give some options to the solver to be able to try out things. So there is a bit of lines of code. Uh, what you can see is that the more concrete you get, the more lines of code you need. And here you can see a big jump because here I need also heuristics, for example, for decisions, and you want to have some sensitive sensible heuristic so it's a lot of codes so, and a lot of data structures which might exist but might not just fit the bill so i implemented um some trees for example for heuristics so i don't have basics but i have some like some another heuristic called acids and this one existed already in isabel but it did not exist in a way which was compatible and efficient. So I had to refine it. And so this is how some lines of code are added, which you might not realize you need. Um, 
yes, one interesting problem, or yeah, one interesting problem I have, which is going rather deep, is that for performance in a side solver, the memory layout is important. And the memory layout you want is actually to have all clauses in a row. Not completely, but for the sake of this discussion. In C++, what you do is that you have some memory allocator and then it does the right thing later. In either side, this is basically hidden by the refinement, so the refinement does this for you, kind of. The problem is that it kind of cannot do it even. So, um, yeah. I think we'll have to switch on the light. Or, so basically, you have the memory, which is the number of cells in a row. And then you have your clause, which is so basically, you have your clause, let's say here, clause one, before you have some headers of the clause, some information, size, LDB. And here again, you have some headers, and you have here the clause two. And then you have headers again, and so on. So this is called an arena. So you put things in memory. And the idea or the advantage of it is that if you are lucky at least, you will access the clauses in the order they are in memory, which is possible. And if they are in the order they're in memory, then actually they are in the cache line, so actually the code becomes faster. Okay, so far so good. The problem is, how do you define the start of the clause? Start, clause one, and then start two. In C++, basically, it's just the pointer to start starting. Um, in either side, this is an integer. So basically, you define the starting point as an offset. So basically, you say, oh, it's, it's an offset. So the problem of an offset is that you are actually losing the information that there is really a clause starting. Because if you have a pointer to a clause, you have an information of the clause. The clause is here. Right? This is a clause. If you have an offset, there is nothing that forbids you to have an offset starting in the middle. Right? So in my approach of uh, with the refinement, basically, I know because of the refinement that I only access valid start clauses. So this is what I mean with hidden. So the problem is there, but it's hidden. Um, there are such solvers which are written in other modern languages are called themselves modern, like Rust, for example, and they also have this problem. And the problem in Rust is that you also have to put this in the logic. So basically, you are moving a responsibility from the compiler, so this is a valid clause, to a responsibility to the, to the programmer, this is a valid offset. Yes, you can switch off that again. Already. So this is the kind of problems you have. And I don't know what a proper solution for this is basically. So in either side, it's fine. It's not as hidden as it should be, but it works out. But in this modern programming languages, it can be weird sometimes, or there is no clear solution. So there's a question that I might have yes. been a while ago, and maybe I missed it. So how many lines of code, yeah, this is probably on this, previous slide, how many codes, lines of codes are generated and how many are really written? Um, so I guess it's like you, you all, write That's the, all generated. Yeah. So that's all written. So the, this lines here, so technically the code is generated, but there is still some setup to tell it to generate code. Mm -hmm. So this lines are mostly just a setup to generate, tell it to generate code. 
Okay, so but all the above the refinements on the left are actually like you typing yes, up lines yes, of code. Yes, yes. On the right, it's just some commented thing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so let's go back to the plots from so the CDF you mentioned before. Uh, and yeah, so again, right, we have either set, we have a large step to T set. And here you can see this category with some options, which I tried. Um, so here you see in blue, this is basically supposed to be roughly the same thing as what I have implemented so far. In green, you have the version. What is it? Yeah, so. Um, so in red, you have radical only, and in green, you have the version that doesn't perform variable elimination. You can see that variable elimination is useful, but somehow the step is still, there is still something there. But what happens if you look at like, you know, the total number of decisions or total number of propagations or total number of conflicts? Like, I mean, if, if you sort of would more or less match there, then you sort of know that you're just slower, right? Or, or could it be that your solver is doing different things? You know, um, so I know that I'm slower at propagations by not that much, but I I have never never fully looked at statistics. But the problem is that there are two issues. The first one is that variable elimination means that you have fewer clauses, which means that you again propagate faster. But so I've observed a, a bit slower propagation, and I don't fully know why. Um, there is a trick in Cadical which I have not implemented, which is that, so I talked about the arena, but actually in Cadical not all clauses are in the arena immediately. So there are clauses which are outside the arena and get only later inside, which is something I don't know how to represent. Because again, right, I need these offsets, and then if I stop outside of the arena, this kind of gets weird. So I'm a bit slower, but not that much slower. And I think there is something else, but I never found this something this basically. Um, one story about it is that- Or like you could look at, I mean, also another measure, like if you're all doing proof logging, like is there a difference in proof logs, right? I mean, that would also exactly. be like a, a re, like a, a quick and dirty measure of if the LRAT proofs are kind of, or DRAT proofs are kind of the same size. You know. uh, yeah. I've never tried that. I should, this is a good point. Yeah, I should try to. Try this out, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. We should try out and see what this does. Um, yeah, there are some things which Catechal has. Um, Yes, so which I don't have, so go to search, and there is this go to search thing, which in essence there is nothing to prove in the or not much to prove in the local search, but I have you write I never had time to write the code so far. And generally it's less convoluted code, so it's easier, I think, for the compiler to understand what the meaning is because with enough inlining it just works better. But I have the trade-off that I want to write proofs more if I want to keep my proofs as much as possible. Um, a story on proofs. So to be part of the main track of the set competition, I need proofs. So I produce proofs. And in the set competition 2023, actually I produce invalid proofs. This is bad. <laughs> So formally verified sub solvers with invalid proofs? <laughs> yes. I can explain what's happening. Um, I, can exp I can show you an example of what's happening. So let's take um, a very simple example where we have Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Let's just. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I try to. Um, okay, yeah, and okay, so I have these clauses here, which are the initial set of clauses. Um, you agree that this is unsatisfiable? Okay, so we have here this is all clauses of next clause, and this is unsatisfiable. So now just assume that for some reason I learned the clause not C over D. It's and it's a trait, right? So it's complete. So it's it's a trait, so it's fine. And then my stock solver might come, look at the clause and say, oh, C here appears only in one phase. So in one direction. So actually I can learn C, which is valid. This is a pure literal basis. And so the direct proof would contain a, li a line which would be hard and C. The problem is that uh, dread trim does not recognize this as a valid addition of a clause because it is not blocked because you have here a learned clause which contains that C. Because the trim does not distinguish between the initial clauses and the ground clauses. And because of this technical thing, because I was adding the unit clause, I actually produce a wrong proof. I think there were three or something. There were a few wrong proofs, basically. So, this, and the reason is behind, besides, behind that is that I never proved anything about proofs. I refuse to prove anything about the proofs. It doesn't make sense to me that I spend the time verifying the solver and then I would try to prove that my proofs are correct. So the proofs I, my set solver generates are correct, right? And I did do that. Proof. Yeah, and so this year for the competition, I've just deactivated this feature because I don't know how to add it. Or I should do very PB. As far as uh, Young told me that very PB would, would be able to do it because very PB has this distinguished distinction between initial and learned clauses. So if, if it's maybe I will maybe you need strengthening the core or something, right? You need to you need to go through some extra hoops, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but yeah, so that's why I probably I probably should try to. I probably could add it, let's put it that way. And it would work. But yeah, this was a shock when I saw this book that I produced wrong proofs. I was a bit afraid, but yeah, it's just a technical thing. Maybe um, we need to discuss this because uh, I'm not quite sure what uh, Matthias is doing with his uh, pure literal clause because, uh, again, if you add a, a unit clause when you have a pure literal, I mean, it won't change the satisfiability of your formula, but this is not something you can, uh, it's not a, a logical consequence of your formula, so you can definitely not put that in a proof. Yes, but it's um the point is that the proof is blocked, so it's a it's a it's a it's a wrapped it's a the clause is wrapped with respect to the initial set oh. of clauses. Okay. But the point is that it's not wrapped with respect to all clauses, so it's only wrapped with respect to the initial set of clauses. If you would have, if you, yeah, you could have added it by wrapped right away. But once you've learned not C or D, then you're screwed because yes. then it's no longer a rest clause. Yes. yes. Yeah. What you could do is delete it and then, but then this does not allow you to reason on this log clause, then, which doesn't seem to be important. But in practice, at least, it's not really useful. 
But yeah, it's not a clause which is entailed by bottom entailed clause. But I think you support what what addition, so it should be fine. But yeah, there are some extra hoops with uh, I need to make sure that the core I have in either side is also the core you have in the proof, which is some work involved, which I have not done yet. So mm. I need some more functions which pass information around mm. in all in their own unverified way <laughs> and get it right. But this is a conclusion. Or you could add it to your, I mean, in your model, even like, I mean, the, 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 the basic set solver model could have a, a, a core set and a derived set. I mean, maybe that's how you should model what the set solver is. Yeah, I mean, it's what I have, right? So I have this core set and derived set. So I really have that already. Mm -hmm. It's just that I currently don't pass this information to the glue part in ah. C, which is printing the proofs. Mm. But it's just about adding some more arguments which tell, oh, now I'm um, moving this close to core or something. Mm -hmm. This is not locked basically currently. So the solver knows exactly what it's, when it's moving things around, but it just doesn't give the information. But the conclusion of this is that um, before the next set competition, I need to do some fuzzing on proofs. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, I'm back to the point where I said earlier that I did some fuzzing and it did not find bugs, but actually I need fuzzing actually to get the proofs done because I don't verify anything about the proofs. Um, I wanted to show a little bit how the codes look, looks like for the all three verified SAT soldiers, which I talked about. So this is a code of Guru. No, that's in Guru. Um, yeah, untype C void pointer is very nice things. <laughs> um, I can tell you a story about this. When I first run it, it worked on the cluster, but it did not work on my local machine. And it took me two days because when I was using uh, Valgrind, it worked. Um, <laughs> And what happened is that, and or what the clue I had was that when I read the code and I saw a function with 32 arguments, because there was a function which took 32 arguments and basically put them into a 32 bit machine. But the compiler I was using was using 64 bit integers. So you had 32 bits which were not initialized, leading to random issues. So yeah, technical things, but this is code in Google. But um, yeah, I want to show. This is a code of Isasat modulo. I just um, called the type something because the types are unfolded in the code. So you see five lines of type. So this is reasonable code, or I would call it reasonable code, let's put it that way. Um, sometimes I have to read it to try to see what's going on. So, yeah, um, the point where it gets weird uh, this kind of here with extracting values out of pairs, which is a bit strange. But... And this is some kind of Isabel language, or what? Is... So, this is you know, this is this LLVM, LLVM, LLVM interfaces representation. Yeah. So no, the Isabel code looks like. Yep. No, wrong side. Oh, yeah. Okay. It so looks... these are the proofs then. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, this, this are only definitions. This is... <laughs> <This is> only... <laughs> no, no. I, for performance, I now have files which are only containing definitions and files which are only containing proofs and one which are only containing group generation uh, generation sentences. So basically here you see the code for unit propagation. So you see here the while loop. Here you can see the invariant of this. Yes. So basically you have a while loop which is doing something. So basically it's iterating 
as long as it's basically doing the food propagation. So it's it, it's iterating over the um, the literals to propagate until it reaches the end of the train. You can see here the invariant which I use. Uh, two more things to see here. You can see here this return start propagate and propagate. Uh, this function I use for profiling because at some point I needed some reasonable profiling code. So basically in the translation at the end what they do, Mr. Grep actually call the timer which starts here and stops here and then I can output stop times which is spent on propagation which is useful to see if I have some weird performance bugs. So, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, this is LDM, so which is why you have void uh, and this is all code that, I mean, you write the Isabel code and this is translation is done automatically. And usually I don't even have to look at this. Um, here you can see Pulsat, which is this approach where you start from writing code. And this code is much better. Um, it's, yeah, so this is Rust code basically. Um, so, which is why the arguments are probably not how we are used to write things, but so basically you have see, you have some code. So it's, so this is also the code to the propagation. It's the same one actually. So if I yeah, so um, so here we have a while loop, which is sorry this yeah direction. So this is also the while loop here, except that. It's unfolded in more low levels, but the while loop is the same. And you can see here you have some invariants and some properties which are supposed to fit. So this is a, I think the best code you can have basically, but it also the uh, yeah, it's also the it's a best code. It's I think this version is a better code because it's more readable. Because it's here, this is a programming language which are meant for human to read. Uh, this is meant for compiler to read, so not much for you. Um, yes. So one of the interesting things is that if you look at this uh, bottom up approaches. They all have a future future work to be more top down in the end. So basically, they want to prove that the propagation is complete, or they want to prove more things. So actually, yeah, they want to be more to be uh, to be more top down at the end. So I don't know if they're still on course that is really working on this. What would be interesting is to link the top down with complete code. Um. Yeah, in retrospect, a bit about the entire thing, besides what I mentioned that I think this is, I'm not sure this is really the future. So that many components in such order are not as independent as you think they are on paper. But for example, a lot of things are parameterized by the set of all variables you can access, like watch list, or you can only access watch list for literals that appear in the set of clauses. Um, yeah, I've done in some cases too much coupling. So, for example, this part, this set of variables I try to not duplicate, which I know, which I realize later I should duplicate everywhere. Yep. And yeah, refactoring takes a lot of time. I want just to show you one. Um, I would just mention it, without showing it. One case of things where this refinement stuff gets weird sometimes. So when you think about the restart heuristic, you have a heuristic which is basically deciding to reuse part of the tray. So what this does is it goes over all decision until some criteria is met. Except that in the abstract code, you don't have the data structure to just go to all decisions. 
And actually, you are comparing the cost of that literal to what your decision heuristic is saying. And decision heuristic does not or should has no reason to really exist on the abstract code. So in some sense, you are trying to prove something about objects that don't exist. And this is a kind of points where this is very weird sometimes to prove, and why I sometimes ended up just having concrete stuff in it while probably want to have some abstract stuff there, because you don't know what you're proving, or you want to manipulate what you're proving about. Because for sure you can say, oh, I, any function will, will do, but then any function will do, you have to make sure that when you synthesize the code, it's picking the right one. And I've had cases where it was picking the wrong one, which is really not what you want. And this has very weird bugs, very weird performance bugs to this. So I think I've reached the end. I think now I've talked long enough now. So let's conclude this. Um, yeah, a lot of the motivation behind verified that solver is not really relevant because we have now the stronger proof systems with very PB. And formalization can sometimes discover bugs, but sometimes, but for example, in verification, we discovered an issue which meant that we just missed some propagations which I know that I would have found if I tried to prove it, but I had not tried to prove it. So basically Armin found it before me. So it was only a performance issue, but it's kind of, okay, well, then it's, now it's fixed. Yeah. But it's the kind of things which are very subtle and was there for five years, I think in Cadical and re-implemented twice and you never realized that it was. A, but it's only a performance bug, so fuzzing will not help you. Okay, then thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I think we asked already lots of questions during the talk, but the final final opportunity for people here or uh, our virtual attendees to ask any questions before we wrap up. Yeah, maybe just a, a question. So uh, with very PB, with the, the next PB evaluation, we will have certified answers, SAT, and SAT optimal solutions. So this is a way to tell, well, people can implement whatever they want. Uh, if at the end of the day, you, the answer can be checked, I'm happy. So when you do a verified uh, SAT solver, you really want that each step is uh, correct. So you mentioned the case that you can gain um, performance issue, you can solve performance issue with a, a verified solver. So um, what do you think um, is better? Because, well, um, for instance, some mathematicians accept for the for, uh, currently uh, open problem solved with um, SAT solvers, with proofs, with Marine, for instance. So um, what do you think is really important? Is uh, Are certified answers sufficient or is really uh, certified solvers the only way to, um, to, to have confidence with, uh, with the outcome of a solver? Um, I think it's a I think mathematicians don't like answers by Marine. No. Because the Marine tells you, oh, this number is a limit, but it doesn't give you information on why or something. I think mathematicians would prefer a reasoning why something is, right? So I don't know. Even if it's something that, okay, this is the, I don't know, first number, the first prime number after the size of groups, which have some properties or something, but this is already telling you more than what Marine is telling you, right? Marine is giving you a number and then also saying that something is impossible. And then you know, okay, it's impossible, but it doesn't really give you a hint why it's impossible. And some, as a mathematician, you usually want to know why, what the deeper link between two things are. So I think this is the first part is that mathematicians accept it because, okay, they know, but if you come up with a better proof with some 
proof which is giving uh, telling you something about the problem, then actually they would prefer pretty much prefer that. Um, and then for the verification versus certification. I, I think certification is the most viable option, at least currently, because it's the easiest one where you can try things out, basically. So if you try things out or you decide, so in SAT, for example, to implement a new heuristic in the SAT solver, it might take you one day. Trying something out in Isabel is something that takes you weeks sometimes or even it's the project for a few months, basically. So trying something quick out is just out of question either way. When, and I think generally in fully verified, in fully verified solvers, this is, will be always a problem. So even if something, if something is fully verified and you decide to change some data structure or something, it will take time. And it will take more time than just a quick and dirty implementation to actually know, okay, does it work or not? Um, yeah. So I was wondering if isn't the issue uh, the fact that you do not have libraries of uh, certified components that you could reuse and that you have to do everything by yourself? Um, because I think this is what they do with Lean. Uh, where they, they try to add more and more mathematical, mathematical statements in the system so that you can create more and more proofs. Um, and and I think, wouldn't it be the case also if you have many, many, many uh, pre-built uh, um, data structure and so on in Isabel, then you would more easily um, or certified uh, solvers, or whether they are SAT, QBF, or, or PB, for instance? I think, yes, I think it would definitely help. So when I have to implement my own data structures, I think no matter you have a bad time. And what happens sometimes is that you already have the data structures, but they are not the way you want them. So they are functional instead of imperative or something. And then in a SAT solver, functional code or functional tree would just not be what you want to have. So there is this limit of probably it will not exactly fit your bill. So this is different for mathematical result, right? Because for the mathematical result, you care about the statement of the theorem and the assumptions, but you don't care about how the proof was done, how it's doing, how it's working internally. So even if the proof is very early, you are happy that it works. Um, when you are doing whether it's actually ver verified programs, whether it's uh, so you are certified verifying a checker or verifying a solver, you do care about this details about how the data structures looks like. So you need to open the box, and then the question is, can you always use the box that you are given? Okay. So, Thanks. Yeah. Oh, the somewhat related question. I mean, listening to you, you get the feeling that somehow what you really would you would want to have some nice primitive, like, you know, give me an efficient array implementation that I can yeah. use, you know, give me so that I can think about arrays and just have sort of yeah. support in your form. And, but, and there is no such The, uh, in... the refinement library, so Sepref, this tool is basically doing this for you. So this uh, transformation from list to arrays, for example, right? So in either way, I just reason about lists, so which are nicely functional, and then I just generate code for it. The point is that if you have more complicated data structures, then often it doesn't exist or it doesn't exactly work the way you want it. Um, or you, I have to ask someone else to do it for me. Um, for example, you have this, how to put it, um, when you have the watch list, watch list, right, it's an array of arrays, basically. Or it's an array of resizable arrays, but anyway, it's an array of array. And the point is that in Isabel, there is this uh, sepref is built on separation logic. 
and this idea that you can separate things. And separation logic means that you can, it's very hard to take an array out, do some transformation and put it back in. So I, for uh, in Isabel LVM, Peter Lamich did this for me, and produced nice proof. For standard ML, I did it myself. It's the most horrible proof I ever got in my life, and I never want to see that one again. Because it's very, very, very ugly. So you are fighting separation logic at each step of this. So here, I think the problem is that, uh, so once I had hidden it away, right? So I had the primitive, and then I did not care anymore about what was happening. But sometimes, so the issue here was that the logic which was used for this refinement is ugly. And here it came out. So sometimes uh, nice, um, so sometimes you can use the nice arrays, but if you have to look at how arrays are defined, then you can enter the really ugly part, which I never had. No, only, I think that's the only time I had to use it. Otherwise, I could use the nice abstraction arrays that you use. So it doesn't happen that often. Usually, you can just be using nice abstraction given, given, given to you by step by step. So with that, maybe it's uh, maybe it's time to thank you again and finally give you a break. <laughs> Thank you so much.